wait a minute, I've got to do this first. I'm sorry, I forgot all about this. So let's do this. You can, you can lead it, but I don't think you can see it good enough, so let me do it. This is our litany for Thanksgiving. We've got a, you know, besides being a celebration day, Thanksgiving's about to happen. You guys, can you see it good on the screen? I think you can. Let's, uh, let's responsibly read this together. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love is everything. Come, let us praise God joyfully. Let us come to Him with thanksgiving. For the good world, for things great and small, beautiful and awesome, for seen and unseen splendors. Thank you, God. For the work to do and strength to work. For the comradeship of labor, for exchanges of good humor and encouragement. Thank you, God. For marriage, for mystery, and joy of flesh made one, for mutual forgiveness and burdens shared, for secrets kept in love. Thank you, God. For family, for living, for living together and eating together, and family amusements and all kinds of family pleasures. Thank you, God. For children, for their energy, their curiosity, their brave play, their startling frankness, and their sudden sympathies. Thank you, God. For the young, for their high hopes, for their irreverence toward worn-out values, their search for freedom, and their solemn vows. Thank you, God. For the growing up and growing old, for wisdom deepened and experienced, for rest and leisure, and for time made precious by its passing. Thank you, God. For your help in times of doubt and sorrow. For healing our diseases, for preserving us in temptation and in danger. Thank you, God. For the church into which we have been called. For the good news we receive by word and sacrament in our life together in the Lord. We praise you, God. For your Holy Spirit, who guides, and ste guides our steps and brings us gifts of faith and love, who prays in us and prompts our grateful worship. We praise God. Above all, O God, for your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived and died and lives again for our salvation, for our hope in Him, and for the joy of serving Him. We praise you, God, our Father, for all your goodness to us. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love is everlasting. Now we're ready to stand and sing We Gather Together. <laughs> Scripture and stuff like that, it'd be fine. I had uh, another thought that I forgot to say is on December the 28th, which is the 
no, excuse me, on November the 28th, which is next Sunday, at about 2 o'clock, we're going to be having our first Eagle Court of Honor here for the our Eagle Scout Troop, the first young man to get an Eagle from here. And then at 5 o'clock, we're going to have the Hanging of the Greens. Uh, since we don't have a green family, then it's much more exciting. Um, because we're just going to have green stuff around the church. But, uh, uh, you know, if we had a green family, it would be a different thing, but we don't. Anyway, it's a ceremony that we do to decorate for Christmas. And so uh, we'd look forward to come and do that. We'd love to have kids for that if for decorating the tree. So 5 o'clock on the 28th, if you if children want to come, grandchildren, whoever, we'd love to have help. Our scripture this morning, we begin with a, a scripture reading from Revelation in the first chapter. Grace to you and peace from him who is and was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who were before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood. And made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we don't have hymnals spread out. Let me see how quick uh, this thing comes back to life. I'll tell you what we can do, though. Well, we can't do that either. We'll just wait. We'll just visit quietly. What do you think about the room set up? What do you think? great. Love it. I like it. Yeah, I've had some people say, can't we just do this all the time? Yeah. It, it's comfortable, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it? It's really pretty cool. So uh, we're moving along. Right now, what you're looking at is a picture of the river. <laughs> oh, I can find it. If you need to. Thank you, Ann. Oh, you know, you're in the wrong. Technology's not that hard. <laughs> As you're able, would you stand? Let's affirm our faith this morning with the Apostles' Creed. My fellow Christians, what is it that we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. seated as we sing together the lily of the valley our words will be up there now.
Friends, as we gather together today to pray, we have so much to be thankful for. Uh, it is a day to be thankful. It's a week to be thankful. And you know, maybe it's to set aside all the stuff we're not happy about and all the stuff that we whine and complain about and be grateful for the things we do have. Uh, they're more than 80% of the rest of the world have. Even our poorest have more than most of the rest of the world. So it's time for us, I think, to give thanks. So let's join me in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for everything. For the gift of life. For our breath. Our friends, our family, our church, our community. Our nation. All of those first responders that are there standing ready whenever they're needed. Our military as they stand ready to protect our freedoms. God, we don't really say thank you enough. We get caught up in all the I wants. I want better health. I want longer life. I want more stuff. And sometimes we need to slow down and remember that we already have so much. And you've given us even a bigger gift that you've given us eternity with you. If we just recognize you as the King of Kings. Of course, once we recognize you as King of Kings, we get called to do some stuff to serve you and to be the heart and hands and feet of Jesus for our community. We are thankful for Jesus who walked on this planet and he showed us what it looks like to live a godly life, a righteous life. And he handed the keys of the church off to Peter and to all of us. He said, go forth and do even greater things than I. It's that Jesus that taught us to pray when he said, our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to now sing in the garden. Uh, I think if you're able, would you just stand as we sing?
Please remain standing as we read the gospel. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own? Or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests has had to have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you're a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And you may be seated. So my question for y'all today is, do you say Jesus is king? You know, I, I, that was the same title we had last night for those of you who were last night. It's a whole different scripture. But do you say Jesus is king? Do we mean that we think Jesus is king? You see, saying it is one thing, but doing it is something else. See, Jesus has made all these commitments to us. Remember what he said in the Gospel of John. He says, you will do greater. He, first of all, he says, you believe because you've seen the things I did, but you will do even greater things. Now that's the king, King Jesus, saying that we're going to do greater things than he did. What do you think's up with that? He went into town and he created discord and upset sometimes, oh, not because of who he was, but because he was against the power structure. He was against the guys that were hanging out up there that were only interested in glory and power. He was not willing to to sacrifice himself too early because he needed to tell his message to people. He, we needed to have the stories. We needed to have the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We need all those stories. Those stories give us strength and understanding. But they don't make Jesus king. See, Jesus being king means that everything ultimately answers to Jesus. Even the people we don't like. Even the people that don't believe like we believe. Even the people that haven't yet come to understand who Jesus is. He did not come to save just the Methodists or the Baptists or anybody else. He came to save the world. And every Christmas we remember that, right? We're going to be in Advent soon. But every we know Jesus came, God Emmanuel, God with us, to save the whole world. And then we kind of get into our little territories and tribes and we think, well, it'd be okay if he saved us first. I mean, nobody really wants to admit that, but I, I've thought it, so I'm quite sure I'm not the only person that ever thought it. I've worried more about me getting to heaven than I have about other people. And with Jesus' attitude was you need to worry about them first. It's only by being a servant to others that we understand what it means to be Jesus Christ. And, and in our neighborhoods, we have a ch task. We, we have a lot of rights given to us as churches. We get to have... Uh, Tax-free status. We don't have to pay uh, property tax. That's nice of them, but don't they don't they think that they should expect something from us in return? Like we become a community resource in the community to make a difference to the community, and we are doing that in some ways. We've done it a lot of ways this year. This has been really, uh, in spite of COVID and all the weird things that happened, we raised about fifty-five hundred dollars or so for kids to go to Champions Kids Camp. Separate from our budget, not including that, to send 11 kids to, to Bill Nash's Champions Kids Camp. We gave away about 45 presents to kids who have parents that were in prison last year. We're about to start that again next week, the Angel Tree Ministry. We, we paid all of our, what we call connectional giving, the things that fund things like UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief. Uh, the, the things that we do to fund uh, Lakeview Methodist Assembly and all the things we call that apportioned or connectional giving, we paid 100% of ours, including the fair share goals, which is not normal, especially in times when attendance has been down and people haven't been around as much. We had an insurance bill that doubled. Some of you are experiencing that as well, I'm sure, but our insurance went from about $11,000 a year to $21,000. It wasn't in the budget. But so far, 
thanks to this church and the people here and the faithfulness of our community, uh, we're still solvent. We're doing what we do and we're continuing to do it. And I believe God gave us this task for a purpose, not just so we could have a beautiful building. In fact, one of the reasons we wanted to take the pews out was so that we could more effectively use our space. This is the biggest, nicest, most air conditioned and heated room in the whole church. And it got used two hours a week. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that didn't make any sense. Now, look, I live in a house that has a dining room that gets used less than two hours a week. But it was there when I got the house because it's the one mom and dad lived in. You know, but we would never build a house today with a dining room set up to the side like that. A formal living room. We never go in there. In fact, my total gym is set up in there. And so we, we, have a, we have a responsibility to figure out how do we effectively use the gifts that God gives us to do the ministry that God calls us to do in this community and around the world. Very soon, if we can work out all the details, that metal building is going to go away. Anne says, praise God, because it shines a light on her and blinds her when she's trying to see us up here. But, it, but more than that, it's an old building that requires significant upkeep. It requires utilities and other things. We have this room, which is way better. Look, there, I don't know how many are here right now. Probably somebody does, but there are seats for about 65 people. That would max that building out. And by now, with that many people in there, it would be so hot we wouldn't be able to stay in there. It's just the nature of that building. And so now we've got resources to do stuff. We've got some other rooms that are going to be and are being used. The women's Bible study meets down there where the men are going to have to, of course, move when that building's gone. We'll come over here to meet. That's all fine. We've got room to use. And it's all inside one place where we're pretty much running the air conditioning anyway. I mean, those kind of things make sense. So we don't take the gifts that our church members and people that contribute to the church lightly. We, we want to use that money in the wisest ways we can. I, 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 I was telling a friend last night, we are frugal, but we're not cheap. So we're going to, when we need, uh, when we need an air conditioning man, we're going to get one. We're not going to try to fix it. Some other churches, they go in there and have the guys fit with it. Look, it took me about three years at this church to unfix the things that the volunteers have fixed. There's just certain things we need to hire somebody to do. And we don't hire them any more than we have to. We don't hire them. We mow the, thanks to Chester and others, but we mow the yard across the field ourselves where the pumpkins are. We only have a week of guy over here because there's a tremendous amount of weed eating to be done around here, and he mows just when we need it. And it looks beautiful today because he came yesterday. He knew we were having a big thing today. So one of the things that happens to churches is we get concerned about are we going to survive? I think the only person in the room, other than Kathy, that was here in 2008, on June the 8th, when I preached my first sermon here, somebody had said, we're a great small church. That's what I kept hearing about Golden Acres Methodist. There is nothing small about the kingdom of God. Amen. And there's nothing small about a church that represents Jesus Christ in the community. Amen. Now, we may not have a lot of numbers, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about effective ministry. The disciples, how many were there? Twelve? They did some pretty effective ministry, right? There's two point some odd billion Christians today. It's not what we have, it's what we do with what we have. And years ago, we decided, for example, uh, to not do vacation Bible school because the big churches in our neighborhood, uh, the Methodist Church over on Fairmont, South Main Baptist on the Bellwood, they do terrific like, vacation Bible school that everyone's invited to. And they're wonderful. We can't compete with that. But they can't do the stuff we do for Golden Acres Elementary at our pumpkin patch. So what we try to do is figure out what we do better than 10,000 other churches and do that the best we can. Now, COVID has kept us from having children's ministry, and we're about to get to a place where, where children are now being vaccinated. And I know every child won't be, but as children get vaccinated, I think things will be returning to significant normal in 2022. We had camp anyway. Bill Nash had camp. We're going to have to do stuff. And so the question is, how do we do that? And every year growing up in the church, I would listen to some preacher stand up in front of some congregation and say, we need your help. Every year. They always did. And every year I found for, for let me think about this for a minute. How old was I in 1997? 46? Is that right? 
Yeah, until I was age 46, I always said, well, how can I know how much I can give you if I don't know how much I'm going to make? I can't make commitments like that. I can't commit to anything. I'll just, I'll give you what I can. And my mentality for 46 years was that I was going to give out of what I had left over. And when I say Jesus is king, I don't think that's what King Jesus wants, is the leftovers. I think what Jesus wants, and we used to have a young man that attended church here. I love to have Jim James, we call him Little James. I always loved to have him around stewardship time simply because he was, uh, he was a little radical and he was loud and he would sit in the back and he would say, give 10% or you're going to hell. Well, that's not my message, okay? <laughs> that's not my message. My message is that, that God needs to become more important in our lives than anything else. And I promise you, I guarantee you, you may not be blessed with more money, but you will be blessed. You will receive blessing upon blessing upon blessing in your life if you make that true. And it happens in all kinds of ways. I mean, sometimes you do get a better job. Sometimes you get promoted. Sometimes you get more money. Sometimes you get a better relationship at home. Sometimes things change at work. Sometimes things just change with your spirit. And instead of walking around with Linus, with you know, either one that has the dark cloud over his head all the time, you become a person with sunshine and glow on your face all the time. I had that happen to me when I was working for Quest. I had people ask me, "Say, what is it about you? How this is? We may lose our jobs, and you're happy." I said, "Well, they can't eat me." <laughs> I mean, really, work is work, but there's always work to do. the The problem is, I think the church has declined over the years, and this is the maybe the most important thing I can say today is that there's a lot of people, and I hear this all the time. I can't wait till we go back to like it was. Well, look. Let me just remind you that how it was wasn't that good. Churches, not Methodists, I'm talking about Christian churches in general have been declining for a long time. Now you're going to say, oh yeah, but there's a big church over there at Red Bluff, they're not, well, you see, when you're a certain size, you don't notice it. It's called unnoticed decline. But I assure you that every church has the same pattern, whereas in my younger days, my mom and dad and me and, and all of my friends and their moms and dads, we all sat together in church every week. And then when I moved away and went to college, there was one person missing. And my other buddies went away, and, and now it's just maybe my mom and dad and somebody else's mom and dad, and the numbers just continue. To, and we make excuses for that. The 50s ain't coming back. What we do for church now has to be different. And I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. I really can't tell you specifically. I, I can tell you that my observation was when we did something, in other words, we didn't just sit here and hear about doing something. When we did something, like unload pumpkins, we had like 50 people out there unloading pumpkins. They came from everywhere. They didn't all go to this church, but they were involved. And it makes me wonder if maybe people want to do stuff, not just hear about we're going to do stuff. And let me tell you, friends, I've been a Methodist for 70 years, <laughs> and the Methodists are as bad as anybody about us. Putting stuff in committee, uh, let's, let's just appoint that to a committee. Or, 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 or uh, you know, we, we, we did that once and it didn't work. You know, or let's go look and see if we can pay for a program to plug in and make it work. Any, anything we can do to write a check instead of getting our feet on the ground. Anything we can do to, to do this the easy way. Oh, you know, let's don't move the tables in here because then we'll have to move the tables out and then we'll have to set up chairs. Oh, that's a lot of trouble. It is a lot of trouble, but it's worth it. It looks so great in here today. And we can see now, this is, trust me, we could get twice this many people in here if we just move the tables around a little bit. I mean, I think it's incredible. And this shows vision that we're ready to do new stuff and new places. And, and i gotta, I got to tell you, people will show up to see it. My friend Jim Killen was a, was a pastor in Deer Park many, 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 many years ago. Uh, he's now gone on to be with God. And he uh, was serving a church over on the west side of town. And uh, kind of near Bear Creek. 
And it was a church that there were new churches. You know, it's kind of like here. There were newer churches close by. And people were kind of flocking to the newer church and leaving the older church sort of sit there. And so he, he, he tried to figure out what to do. And, he, and one, of his, one of his dreams was, well, I'll just take all the people that don't come anymore and I'll write their names down with their phone numbers and I'll give them to the Pentecostal preacher. There's a lot of humor in that if you think about it. I mean, we're like the frozen chosen and they're going to send them over to the Pentecostal guy where they jump up and down the screen during in church. He said, they'll be back in our church in a couple of weeks. That was a joke, okay? But, but what he did do is they got everybody together and they said, do you want to be evangelistic in our neighborhood? In other words, do we want to reach new people? I mean, if I ask y'all that question, what would the answer be? Do you want to reach new people? Now, we don't know what they look like, right? Some of them are young, some of them are old, some of them are tall, some of them are skinny, whatever. We don't know, but we want to reach them. So it was interesting because when they made that vote that day, the next Sunday, they had 15 or 20 new visitors and they hadn't even done it yet. It changed the attitude. That's why I don't like to use the word small church. Now, there's some advantages. You know, hey, COVID has taught us there's some advantages to being a church this size versus one that has 60,000 people, right? You're a whole lot less likely to get sick here. We can socially distance. We can put on masks. We can do whatever is required. Most of our church people have been so welcoming about trying to stay safe. We did lose a member. He said, if I have to wear a mask, he's not coming back. Okay. Because it's the good of the many, not the few, right? And I, I'm not sitting here telling you you need to be vaccinated. That's your decision, whatever that is. But what I'm telling you is all of us want to be safe and healthy. And we can't be here to help other people. This church so far, out of almost 18 months of COVID, we've not had an outbreak from anything we did at the church. Now, I think that's not only because maybe I set some rules or our administrative council did, but you guys participated Amen. and did that. And that means that we, we're willing and we've got effort, we got we got the ability to do it. So now we just got to kind of let God guide us into where we're going for the future. So in a few days, after Thanksgiving, Faye and I will get together and we'll start working on a budget. And we'll try to figure out how we're going to get through the next year. <coughs> after the food comes, in a little while, uh, while we're eating, I'm going to bring around an envelope. And in that envelope, it has a letter and a card. I don't want you to do anything. You don't even have to open it today. This is a party. I promised you a party. We're having a party. We're going to celebrate and have fun. But take it home. And as you celebrate Thanksgiving and as you prayerfully consider what you can do financially to help us next year, then we'll be grateful to receive those in the days to come so that we can plan our budget. It's always one of those tough things. People say, well, uh, you know, I don't know what, what I can do. And, and, you know, Kathy and I faced that. She retired last year. Or was it the year before? Anyway, she retired. So we there's a significant change in her income, right? And so we had to face, well, I wonder what we're going to do about giving. And we prayed about it. And we were able to keep going at the same rate we were. And consequently, uh, I mean, I could list for you all the millions of things that go on in our life that are good. Some things are not. You know, in the process of all that, I got to have cancer. Uh, we thought we had it nipped in the bud for two years. I was undetectable. It's detectable again. I don't know what that means. I'm going to find out Monday when I go to the doctor. Uh, it means something. I appreciate your prayers. I asked my oncologist when I talked to him, I said, well, do I need to like make funeral plans? He said, not today. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be around for a while. We're going to do stuff. Uh, you know, if I were to ask for a share of hands raised in here for cancer survivors, we've got a room full of them. And we're going to keep on surviving and serving God. Amen? Amen? And so this is, you know, it's like one of those things, a lot of people don't want to ask for money. I'm not asking you for money. I'm asking you to pray and see what your faithfulness to God for the ministries done by Hope Community United Methodist Church are. And when we know what those are, then we'll do our best to plan stuff around that as much as we can. So I always feel like I made a promise. Uh, Evelyn might remember it. it. It was a long time ago, 12 years ago or so. But I made a promise that I would always tell you, first of all, I promised I would never give less than 10% to the church. I see that as my goal. That's just what I do. I'm not telling you what you should do. There's lots of charitable things you can do in life. There's lots of ways to give your time, treasure, and talent. 
But I, uh, Kathy and I have evaluated it and we're this year, in spite of all of COVID and the other stuff, uh, we're gonna continue to give $350 a week to the church. Uh, that's what we do. And I think you have a right to know that since you pay me. Nobody else needs to know what you decide. Those conversations are kept very private and confidential. The only person right now in our church that has any clue about what anybody gives is me. Uh, the money counters, they don't get to see the same thing all the time, so they don't know, and I'm the only guy that sees that, and I, I have a sworn obligation not to tell. So I, I'm telling you, friends, there are people in this church and every church I've served that a $2 a week donation was all they could do, and that's worth every penny as much as 350 that Kathy and I give. This is not a judgment of how much. We just need people to do what they can so we can do the work that God's called us to do in the days to come. The scripture, you know, it almost seems out of place. You know, we're about to go to Christmas time and here we are crucifying Jesus. But you know, the thing he says at the end, for this I was born. For this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Do you hear Jesus calling you? Sometimes it's louder than others. The loudest I ever heard him speak directly to me when I was in seminary and I would need to study for an exam and the next day I would hear before the exam from Jesus. I believe Jesus. It sounded like a British accent. It must have been Jesus. <laughs> They're always have British accents on TV. Anyway, Jesus said, I hope you study. <laughs> you know, a lot of us want to line up at the pearly gate, and Jesus is likely to say to us, well, you remember when I called you? And I think he's calling us, calling this church, this community, this group of people to serve it, to be faithful to it, and to lead this corner of God's little kingdom into the future. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And it is Thanksgiving Sunday as well, so we're going to sing For the Beauty of the Earth. It's one of those beautiful songs that almost everybody knows. As you're able, would you please stand as we sing. But before we sing, let me give one direction quick. So, are they setting up, Kathy? Are they almost set up? So, wh which way are we going to go? Okay, so raise your hand in the air. Rodney, raise your hand. There you go. So, you see where Rodney's standing. We're going to go out that door. We're going to go into the door just behind the church and go by the serving tables and come back in this door on the other side. And you can sit where you are now or back in another place. It'll probably take you two trips to get the drink and the other stuff. That's fine. Just try to keep the line going so we don't get congested. Uh, I'm excited about this. Later on in the future, we'll have a serving window. We don't have that yet today, but uh, this is an experience for us to do it. Let's sing this song and, and just understand as we finish singing this, I will not only bless the food, but give us a benediction.
change, you placed eternity in our hearts and gave us the power to discern good from evil. Grant us sincerity that we may persistently seek the things that endure, refusing those things which perish. And that amid things vanishing and deceptive, we may see the truth steadily, follow the light faithfully, and grow ever richer in that love which is the life of all people through Jesus Christ our Savior. God, as we gather to celebrate this past year and look forward to the next, take this food and those that prepared it and bless them and bless that food so that as we eat it and join together in this celebration, we're inspired to become the heart and hands and feet of Jesus Christ for our community and for the world. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. And you can begin to find your ways to the lunch. And those of you, I, I noticed Maxine sitting in the back so everybody could go, yay, Maxine. Yes.